Thank you, everybody, and welcome. The authority of political and academic institutions over musical values can offer a sometimes too consistent and perhaps static experience of music listening and performance. An outcome of that static experience can be the alienation of musicians and music audiences from the connections between artists, society, politics, and economics. This tends to reduce the scope of music performance to large categories, such as classical or popular, which exclude complex aesthetic particularities from musical discourse and public engagement. Today, we would like to offer our perspective of these three works for flute and piano from a performance-minded uh, and historical point of view. This will include an examination of the context in which these pieces were written, and of the relevant connections between society, art, culture, politics, and economics that surrounded the composers Paul Hinneman, Francis Poulon, and Ota Taktakishvili between the early 1920s and late 1960s in Germany, France, and Russia. The structure of our recital will be defined by three elements around which we will present each piece. The first one, in the voice of my friend and collaborator Teresa Diaz, will contain a general description of musical elements that make up these pieces. And we hope that that will contribute to your experience while you engage in listening to the piece. The second part of the presentation is our performance of each piece. And in the third part, we will offer a broad but critical look into the social historical moment in which each composer lived and how it relates to their personal and musical choices. Citing one of 20th century most relevant philosophers of music, for the first of several times throughout this presentation, Theodor Adorno, quote, while working internally through their experiences with the world in the subconscious, so to speak, they could write music that, if followed a subjective urge, could register not just their personal feelings, but also the general experience of their society. Hence, we aim to have a room full of engaged music participants, performers, and listeners. And we invite you to contemplate and reflect on the quality and meaning of our contemporary musical values and how they may have been shaped by musical and academic institutions over the past 100 years. The first work that we're going to play tonight is the Sonata for Flute and Piano by Paul Hindemith. He was a composer, theorist, violinist, and conductor, who along with Kurt Bale and Ernest Kranek became the driving force of the new objectivity movement in the post-war one in the Germanic music. Hindemith studied violin from an early age, and then eventually he added composition to his studies. As a violinist, he performed with the Frankfurt Opera Orchestra, and he was the soloist of the premiere of Stravinsky, uh, L'Histoire du Soldat. After he came back uh, from the band in which he was playing at World War I, he rejoined the Frankfurt Opera, and he also served as a violist in a string quartet. After the Nazis came to power, they banned much of his music, citing cultural Bolshevism. And in 1936, the ban was placed to all Hindemith's music. He resigned from his teaching position at the Berlin Conservatory, and he started doing tricks to get his music performed outside of Germany. The composition of this particular sonata happened in 1936, and it was premiered in the States by George Ferrer, who is known as one of the fathers of the flute school here in America. This particular sonata challenged the flutist, among with all the series of sonatas that he then it wrote in this series of, as this series of pieces. For the flute, it brings up new challenges 
in the technical aspects that the Fritzes used to do back in those days. And the language in which the music is written, it's pushing the boundaries of what they used to conceive in terms of harmony and melody. And particularly if we compare this sonata to other works written for the instrument in the time, we will find a unique way of treating the polyphony and the harmonies. This is a three movement work in which, along with other, the other sonatas that we will play tonight, it features this characteristic of having a fast, slow, and then a fast movement. 
1936. So was this before he was excommunicated, as it were? Or? Well, I'm about to talk about it <laughs> for a while. So, <laughs> um, so um, just as a reminder, we will have a section to talk about the piece and the composer critically after we perform it. Hillenis chamber works are usually performed in an academic setting, such as this one. Particularly popular are his instrumental sonatas, where he showcases violin, viola, trumpet, flute, and other instruments. From a performance perspective, their present value inside of academia is similar to the one Hindemith attached to them as a performer and teacher himself, expecting that they would serve as pedagogical tools to understand particular theoretical concepts and to develop technical virtuosity on each particular musical instrument, similar to what an etude would do for any instrumentalist. In the mid-1930s, and he wrote this flute sonata in 1936, Hinnemith was living in Germany, a political, a political environment in which, despite not being really involved with it, he was struggling to maintain acceptance and recognition under the fascist German government. Hindemith was aware of the musical ideals that other 20th century composers were striving towards, a movement that led further away from tradition and tonality. In his youth, he gained some recognition for his early experimentations as part of this avant-garde movement, but an ongoing interest in neo-baroque and neoclassical forms would later be the essential characteristic of his work. However, he rejected the separation of harmony and counterpoint from musical meaning. In his own words, and I quote, harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic laws as worked out in a most beautiful and exalted composition would transform the world's woes and falsehood into the ideal habitat for human beings, who by the same process of musical ennoblement would have grown into creatures worthy of such a paradise. End quote. He put great emphasis on melodic counterpoint, attributing to it a metaphysical quality, one that would bring composer, performer, and listener into a mental state in which, as uh, musicologist Kit Chapin says, if they could assimilate the interplay of tones, they could feel their participation in the great harmony of the world. Another musicologist in contemporary of Hinnemann's, Haha Stuckenschmidt, put the situation of counterpoint in the position of listener this way. Our senses are capable of perceiving, perceiving and following several different processes at once. This ability can be trained and directed to many practical and artistic ends. In a degree, depending partly on the capacities of the individual and partly on cultural and historical conditions. These historical conditions for Hindemith are characterized by his reluctance to emigrate from Germany, despite the Nazi government's view of him as a Jewish Marxist. Hinnemith's place inside of this political environment was constantly challenged by political polemical statements from right-wingers that conceived of him as a modernist and as being against German, German uh, cultural history and values. That face of youthful experimentation and heavy influence from contemporary modernists had ended for him in 1929 around the time when he became more interested in neoclassical forms and a return to traditional methods. It is arguable how much of this was led by the rigid cultural limitations that the German state imposed on Jewish artists during World War II, and how much was Hindemith's personal choice. If we grant that this music indeed reflects a clear picture of the musical values are at least somewhat consistent with the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, of the musical values and structures that were more important to, to Hindemith, so too can we recognize that these values are at least somewhat consistent with the demands of his historical and geographical situation. Michael H. Hader, in his book, uh, Composers of the Nazi Era, 
investigates Hindemith's political and ideological contradictions. Contradictions that seem to have been produced circumstantially as the political climate shifted around him. For instance, while he was still in Germany, Hindemith was teaching at the Berlin Music Conservatory and focused on getting his music performed around Germany, or one would say he obsessed with the idea. Most of his music, however, was blacklisted until the end of World War II. Subsequently, until he left Germany in 1938, there was a constant push and pull between him and the, and the Nazi government. Uh, Hindemith still received some support from his colleagues, uh, and they were talking about how to continue his career in Germany, as that was his priority as a composer. One of the possibilities to do so was in education, albeit at a time where the Hitler Youth Project was being developed, though. Some critics see this as an indicator of Hindemith's conformism with the government, which is also regarded as a conformism apparent in his musical choices. As the musicologist, musicologist and philosopher Theodor Adorno put it, Hindemith's generation still brought talent and skill to its efforts. Its moderation was evidence above all in its entirely unprincipled intellectual compliance in compositions made to suit whatever the occasion, and finally, in the liquidation of its contemptible program, along with everything else musically discomforting. They came to their end in a respectively routinized neo-academic style. While Hindemith was fundamentally interested in counterpoint and harmony as a principle, he believed that music should, quote, portray a positive image towards which society should strive, end quote. It is unclear, however, why is it that he shows Baroque counterpoint or common practice harmony as part of that ideal vision. Adorno, for instance, thought that this interest revealed a coercive social structure. He argued that not only did the conventions of tonal harmony develop according to a historical uh, logic, but the dominance of tonality was allied to restrictions on individual freedom proper to capitalism and bourgeois society. If composers chose to follow harmonic conventions of functional tonality, they did so at the price of their true subjective sensibility." End quote. Maybe a criticism of Hindemith's work from this philosophical perspective, one that does not moralize about his place in history, but rather engages in a criticism of determinative institutional practices and ideology, can help expose issues of musical meaning in our current times. That criticism would be best described as an inquiry into the political and economic circumstances that music springs forth from. More than accepting previous definitions of natural laws of music and particular musical content, and reflect how music and society are connected through ideology to one another. Our next composer is Poulain. He was French composer and pianist, and he was part of a group named The Six. This group was aiming to liberate the French musical aesthetics from influences outside of France. Poulain's father was the director of a family of pharmaceutical business, and his mother came from a family of artists craft craftsmen. He had a deep Catholic faith, which we can see inherited in his music. Poulain's mother introduced him to playing piano at the age of five, and then he was thinking and trying to pursue uh, education at the conservatory, but the war and the early death of his parents kind of upset all the plans that he had. Poulain studied piano privately for a few years, and then he started to get his music performed in important venues. About a, a, few, years, a few years after this, in 1947-48, he did uh, his first trips to the United States. 
in which he was gaining some of his pieces from here and he was playing concertos. This sonata that we're going to play next was written in 1957 and it seemed to solidify Fulan's connection with the United States. This sonata was dedicated to the memory, kind of dedicated, of Elizabeth Sprague, who was uh, one of the American chamber music patrons of the College Foundation. They got in touch with Fulan in 1956 and offered him a commission for a piece for chamber music. And Jean-Pierre Rampal, who was a well-known flutist, gave the unofficial premiere of this work and Poulain was playing the piano. And in one of the letters, Jean-Pierre Rampal says the following. You know, you've always wanted me to write a flute sonata. Well, I'm going to, he said. And the best thing is that the Americans will pay for it. I've been commissioned by the College Foundation to write a chamber piece in memory of Elizabeth College, who I never knew. So I think that this is yours. <laughs> 
product of a social and political system changing around him, leaving him to reconcile his own contradictions, Francis Poulon was more of a participant in the political world, outside of his compositional world. Poulon, after uh, studying piano lessons, he actually couldn't participate from the conservatory life. He enlisted in the army instead. But as musician uh, and music historian Leslie Sprout notes in her book, uh, Musical Legacy of Wartime France, quote, Poulain had a much easier time as a soldier in the French army than most of his fellow composers. So you can imagine what that means, right? <laughs> Instead of being forced to sit idle in a field during months of tense anticipation, Poulain was sent on a goodwill tour by the administration of fine arts with baritone Pierre Bernard to give concerts in January and February 1940 in Portugal, Italy, and Switzerland." End quote. Just as his bourgeois background and his modern lifestyle created tensions for him, so too was his musical interest polarized between tradition and modernity. Quote, he too experienced tensions between the universal or outside influences and the national, the pull of the present and the nostalgia for the past, and the attraction of popular and elite art. Like other young composers of this period, Poulain was fully cognizant of all of these contemporary intellectual conflicts, which informed his work in the 20s and would help to determine his stylistic and political direction in the 30s." End quote. Poulain, Poulain was well aware of the political contradictions of his time, and as part of Lassie's, the composer's group, he tended to be more to the conservative side than the extreme radical such as the work of his contemporaries of the second Viennese school. Musicologist Folker, Jane Folker, situates them as, quote, part of the post-war rebellion, but equally part of its sub subsequent search for answers to questions that had been posed by the war, as well as by the political polarization that followed. Powerful cultural and intellectual tensions subtended their innovations in musical style, innovations that are not fully explicable in terms of the internal development of the musical language itself." End quote. Volker goes on to describe Polanc as being most musically similar to Igor Stravinsky, sharing with Hindemith the tendency to look back in history and rearrange his musical ideas to frame them inside of past compositional techniques and forms. The difference is that, quote, for Poulain, as opposed to Stravinsky, the past was not a foreign object to appropriate or a challenging technical construct, but rather a part of his own identity. Poulain deftly captured the 18th century ironic cutting humor in order, incisively, to criticize his culture often evoking the 18th century's greater freedom in sexual mores as a commentary on his own day." End quote. Many of his humoristic representations of traditional conservative musical references, and even some of the folkloric patterns, give a sense of nostalgia with a touch of sarcasm and irony, instead of serving as an homage to their original form, so he's mocking this, uh, past in a way in his music, or instead of giving a statement of purity in nature, as would be more common in, say, Hinnemann's work. In an analysis of Polak's music and political views, the consistent element that prevails is precisely the contrast between the two social worlds that he was part of a contrast that was underscored by his internal struggle caused by discovering his homosexuality as a Frenchman in the 1930s. Poulenc found himself marginalized. He was criticized by the left and by the right at the same time, just as Hindemith was. His financial situation, despite coming from a wealthy family, he ran out of money. <laughs> uh, so his financial situation was not very good, 
and he suffered periodically from depression that actually caused him to be institutionalized. After the 30s, Poulenc had to rely on commissions, lectures, and concerts for income, just as many other composers did at the time. In fact, Poulenc shared a patron with uh, Nadia Boulanger, as both were supported by the princess Edmond de Polignac. Adorno wrote in 1949, quote, patron and artist who always had a precarious relation are mutually estranged. The patron has no relationship whatsoever to the work, but he still commissions it as an exception, as an instance of that cultural obligation that itself proclaims the neutralization of culture. For the artist, however, the fixing of deadlines and specific occasions suffices to extinguish the spontaneity required by the emancipated capacity for expression." End quote. Adorno's concern with autonomy and freedom in art is well supported with numerous examples throughout the history of music, but reflected so clearly in the current situation of music as it survives almost solely as an industry. Even for Poulenc, his sonata for flute and piano gives a clear example of the separation between the patron and the content of the work, just like my friend Teresa said. He didn't even know the person who, who, for whom the piece was dedicated, so he wrote it instead because it was a commission and it was paid by the Americans, right? From an academic standpoint, Poulenc's experience may be more familiar to ours than Hindemith's. As musicologist Volker describes when referring to Le Cis, most of the members of the group did share a common educational experience. They had attended the conservatoire and some the scola as well, as music school, either before or during the war. This meant that they were well versed in music history, for not only was it stressed at the school, but this was the first generation to experience the required courses in music history introduced by Foray in 1905." End quote. Poulenc existed in a social world where music academia was establishing itself much more strongly in the Western world, as we know it now, and where differences in politics or ideas of musical greatness were sometimes neutralized by the institutionalization of music and musicians inside of the conservatory. Hopefully, this general sketch of Poulenc can help us understand that element of his compositions may be a reflection of uh, changing social relations, relations between patron and artist, and the then new modernist development of a music historical canon. Poulenc's awareness of these social relations may make him a cynic, or may simply mark him as a master of the musical meanings of a tradition slipping away. The last piece from this concert is by Otter Tataksvili. This flute sonata was written in 1966, and it's a good example of how some composers mix folk traditions in this classical language. This sonata appears to be published in the United States in 1977, which is interesting to note that took about 11 years to get here. And this was because the USSR had very strict copyright restrictions prior to the 1970s. Taktakisvili music mixes things from the folk, and it's a bit unclear in, if in this particular sonata he was drawing things or he was just using a reminiscence of this tradition. Otar Taktakisvili <laughs> lived his whole life in Tbilisi, in the Republic of Georgia. Most of the scholarly literature about him and his work, which is very limited, focuses on general aspects of his life as part of the conservatory in Georgia, and later on as a minister of culture of the Georgian SSR and member of the Central Committee of the Georgian Communist Party. 
His activity as a composer, teacher, and bureaucrat in the USSR is, as far as we can see, closely related to his musical choices, almost impossible to separate. However, musical choices for composers inside of the USSR, even after Stalin, uh, Stalin's death, were primarily, primarily limited to the cultural priorities of the state. As Robert Slusser wrote in 1956, quote, contemporary Soviet policy in music found its fullest and clearest expression in a resolution of the Central Community Committee of the Communist Party dated February 10, 1948. This resolution, which it's, it's a law, called on Soviet composers to write music with an explicit program or text. Based on easily recognizable melodies, the compositional and harmonic principles of Russian folk music, and the aesthetic tradition of the 19th century Russian classical composers, music, in other words, which could be made to serve the political ends of the Communist Party." End quote. It isn't clear in the literature how much Taktik is really personally engaged with the ideals that he represented by becoming a minister of culture, but he was seemingly respected throughout his career the subject of praise by some critics, and he received multiple prizes from the USSR. There is, however, heavy influence from the USSR policies on music on his statements and priorities as he reacted to the aesthetics of Western art in the 60s. His position as the secretary of the National Composers Soviet for the USSR during this period makes it very difficult to separate any of his personal views from his professional and political ones. In that official capacity, in the late summer of 1960, he was invited to participate in a uh, conference of composers in Canada. And I quote, when he was talking about serialism, he said, I have the impression that we are dealing with only dry computations and calculations and figures. When you discuss serial music at great length, you are inclined to overlook the true vocation of music, its task to influencing and acting on human sentiments, human emotions, and the human soul." End quote. Takta Kishvili often praised composers who would demonstrate their inclination for tradition. Talking about a composer in Azerbaijani, he said, comrades, in the person of Kara Karayev, we have a wonderful, talented composer who is well aware of folk principles, putting the folk heritage into practice in his music. A composer with his own style, proficient in all modern means of musical expressiveness. On behalf of my delegation, I would like to express general delight at his ballad, Seven Beauties. We are surprised that such a splendid, outstanding piece has not yet been staged in the Bolshoi Theater of the USSR." End quote. In general, Takta Kishvili's musical works are aesthetically consistent with the musical ideas in, of the USSR, that music should represent a proletarian culture, newly manufactured just like the neoclassicism of Western Europe, that was theorized explicitly through state-supported means and defined by bureaucrats as the only musical possibility. Reflections of Russian folk music and his rejection of the modern tendency and its abstract or unrecognizable melodies are evident in this sonata for flute and piano that we're going to play. Even when dissonance does play an important role, it does, it does not do so as a central component of tonal structure but instead as a rhythmic element that does not compete with the references to traditional Russian music throughout the piece. In this way, Takta Kishvili's use of dissonance has less to do with the dissonances of German expressionism in the 20th century than it does with Monteverdi's Seconda Practica at the turn of the 17th century. Similar to Poulenc's and Hinnemann's approaches, Takta Kishvili looks back into the musical past to create the musical present. 
each shared the desire to create a new version of the musical world that already exists rather than to follow modernist tendencies that lead to a radically different listening experience. It is important to note, when we can, that modernism and its other, traditionalism, go hand in hand, and that social and institutional power, the positions of composers in society and history, can itself be a part of musical meaning. It is still as performance and as listeners our job to create and discuss musical meanings critically by trusting ourselves to use our individual power to listen, to reason, and to discuss with one another. 